very simple title to this message that I want God to speak to us. It's called Victorious Secrets. <laughs> and before the guys get all excited, it's not Victoria Secrets. It's Victorious Secrets. These are things that get lost when you're in the middle of your battle that the enemy wants to keep from you. First of all, God has promised us victory. 2 Corinthians 2.14 says, Now, thanks be unto God, which always, somebody say always, always, always causes us to triumph in Christ and maketh manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. I like the part that says always causes us to triumph. If he always causes us to triumph, that means he wants you to win. He wants you to have victory. Somebody may tell you, well, you know, you're going to win some, you're going to lose some. Let that be somebody else's experience, okay? I want you to say, he always causes me to triumph. That means no matter what the battle, you're going to win. It's his will. Not sometimes, but always causes us to win. Now, if he always causes us to win and have triumph, that means he always causes us to fight. You're going to fight. You're going to have battles within, battles without, battles against demonic forces, temptation, financial battles, physical and health attacks against you, battles against people that the devil will use to try to derail you and derail God's blessings that are supposed to be flowing in your life. But victory comes at the end of a battle. That's when you start rejoicing, when you have a new testimony, when you Facebook it and tell everybody, wow, look what the Lord has done. Please don't Instagram what you look like in the middle of the battle. People will detach from your sight. When you win. Now, the Bible speaks about it and says, calls it the end of the Lord. Look in James chapter 5, verse 11. It says, Behold, we count them happy which endure. That means those who stick it out till the end. And then it gives the example of Job. You have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful <coughs> and of tender mercy. You have seen, first it says you have heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. Job happened in the Bible not so that we can think that's our model because just the way he lost everything, I'm going to lose everything. What happened to him is going to happen to me. What happened to Job was so that you could hear of his patience and see the end of the Lord. Job was a lesson that God showed the devil. That's what Job is all about. It's not about, oh, what happened to him is going to happen to me. No, it happened to him so we could hear of his patience. He stuck it out. And so we could see the end of the Lord, the victory that happened at the end. <laughs> but it was a lesson that God was showing the devil. That's what Job was about. God was teaching the enemy of your soul that there are people who will hold on regardless of what they go through. Things don't go my way. I am patient and I'm going to ride this out. The, the end of the Lord. Somebody say end of the Lord. End of the Lord. That's what it calls the blessing that he experienced. Because when he was in the middle of his problem, oh my God, the Bible shows the beginning of his life. He was rich, had parties every day, his family hung out, had was, he had everything he needed. In fact, it bugged the devil so much. He said, yeah, he, he's spoiled. That's why he serves you, takes stuff away, and he'll curse you. And God said, I'm going to show you, devil. You take stuff away. I like the devil said, take, put your hand against him. If God puts his hand on him, he gets blessed more. So God says, no, you put your hand against him. Don't touch his soul, but go in. And he did. He had a field day taking away his money, his cattle, his properties, his buildings. He lost everything, even his health. And, and you know, the first thing that the enemy got rid of were his animals, his beasts. And the reason he killed his animals first, listen carefully, this is important because... Every day, he would sacrifice one as an offering to the Lord. That was his offering every day. And the, the devil knew 
that as long as he was giving to God first every day, there was a covenant between God and whoever does that. And it's found in Malachi. It says, I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. So when you offering and tithe and give first fruits to the Lord as he did, there was a covenant of protection over him, which is broken when you stop offering. Wow. So the devil says, if I want to get in and mess with his goods, first I'll kill all of his beasts and his animals that he gives as an offering. And after that, took everything away, his money and his buildings and, 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 and destroyed everything. He lost everything. The only thing he didn't lose was his wife. <laughs> Listen, how messed up was she that the devil said she stays? I'm really going to torture him. <laughs> no, think about it. The Bible says when he's all messed up and swollen and in pain, she walked in and said, you mean you still believe in God after he did this to you? If I were you, I'd curse God and die. The devil said, okay, she stays. Don't mess with her. Half of my work is done. Listen, if you're a spouse, don't dogpile on the rabbit. When your husband or wife is under attack, learn to encourage and say, we're going to make it through this, honey. We're going to make it through this. He saw the end of the Lord, and he was blessed with more than he had before. When a battle begins, you're under attack. You still have hopes that it's not going to be that bad, that it's going to finish quickly, that things are going to turn around. That's the beginning of the battle. The end of the battle is really good because you win. You have a new testimony. You didn't lose your eyesight. You didn't break the bank. You didn't lose your business and your family is back together. I love to hear testimonies. And, and nowhere in the world do you hear better testimonies than at a victory outreach. Yeah. I was messed up. My family was messed up. My body was messed up. And I made new. I love to hear those testimonies. Mine's kind of boring. I was raised in church. <laughs> I'm actually a treasure out of lightness. <laughs> like, church all my life, but I needed to get saved too. <laughs> so the end of the battle is the victory. The beginning, you're hopeful, but here's the really tough part of the battle that I'm going to deal with. I'm going to show you what to do in the middle of your battle. When you're in the thick of it, the worst part of any battle is when you're in the middle of it. When Job was in the middle of it, his friends tried to comfort him and they said, oh, oh man, you look bad. I don't know what you did, but you deserve a worse punishment than what you got. When people reject you, misunderstand you, nobody to turn to, when you're in the middle of battle, that's when you doubt everything, lose everything, feel like you're going to fall, fail, die. I don't remember those scriptures. Let me go back and remember what Pastor said about that. Let me go and click right here and hear that sermon again. What did Joyce Meyer say about what I'm going through? That's when you forget everything. And can I tell you something? You're not going to die. You're not going to die. The disciples really thought they were going to die. When they were in the middle of that storm, Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. The Bible says they're running around like crazy people saying, we're going to die, we're going to die, we're going to die. In fact, they got a little bug that Jesus didn't get up and fix it, fix it right away. Don't you care? We're dying over here. You know, honestly, I wish I could say I've never prayed that prayer before. <laughs> Don't you care what I'm going through? We're dying over here. Jesus got up. It wasn't that he didn't care. To be able to sleep in the middle of a storm, you got to have faith and peace that passes all understanding. You're not dying. Dying people don't run around screaming, I'm dying. They just die. No, we're not dying. You're not sinking. It's not over. The credits are not rolling. What you are is in the middle of a battle. It wouldn't be a battle if you could figure it all out. If you knew exactly what to do. If you understood everything that's going on. But because it's a battle, you're going to get angry, depressed, and weak, and nervous, and frustrated. So I'm going to show you some biblical secrets that when you're in the middle of that attack, whether it's physical, a disease that's supposed to cripple you, or something that's financially supposed to ruin you, or a court case that 
your own attorney says you lost, I'm going to show you what to do in the middle of the battle. And these secrets, I want you to know, are really not secrets. They're in God's word. But when you're in the thick of battle, the enemy tries to take these principles away from you, hide them under the, the fear of what do I do next, under the pain that you're going through. They're in God's word. And the strength of the storm, sometimes we lose these. So here are these victorious secrets, secrets to stay in victory and to receive God's blessing in your life. What the enemy wants to do is make you stop trusting God. He's going to throw everything at you. He's not going to twiddle his thumbs and say, I lost another one. <laughs> He's going to hit you with attacks. And when you're in the middle, this is secret number one. First, remember that the end of the Lord is coming. In other words, that battle you're going through, it's temporary. Come on. I know it feels permanent. It feels like it's been with me all the time. You can't see the beginning of it. And it's never going to end. You can't see the end of it. That's because you're in the middle of it. But especially when you're in the middle, you have to remember that there will be an end to this. God has promised that this will end in triumph always. Somebody say always again. In Job's case, the end of the Lord was more health, more wealth, more blessing, a longer life, and everything that he had lost and much more did God bless him at the end of the Lord. You have an end of the Lord coming too. Somebody say amen. amen. <laughs> say my end of the Lord is coming. Lord. What does it look like? Look at it well. It means your body will be healed. Your finances will be restored. <laughs> Diabetes will leave your body. You'll have peace of mind, new strength. Whatever you need, the end of the Lord says it's yours. And it's coming. You're going to have a new testimony of the power of God. When the battle gets rough, remind yourself that the end is coming. In other words, this is not going to last forever. I know it's going to be over. Psalm 30 and verse 5 says, For his anger endureth but for a moment. His favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. In other words, I'm going to be happy again. I may not feel happy right now. I may be miserable because of what I'm going through, but don't do what Elijah did. When, when you start realizing this is temporary, this too will pass, get out and start working and doing something constructive again. Yeah. What did Elijah do when he got messed up? He ended up in a cave. He had just called fire down from heaven, made fun of and destroyed hundreds of false prophets. God used him, more importantly, to bring revival to all of the people. And after that mighty anointing upon him and that great miracle publicly, in the next chapter, we find him in the cave saying, I wish I were dead. I wish I had never been born. I'm no better than the other prophets that have been destroyed. Yeah, he was remembering all the prophets that Jezebel had killed. I'm just going to be another one. You just forgot you killed a couple of hundred yourself. Uh, and, you know, it makes you forget your victories. And he's in there, and the Lord says, what are you doing here? In other words, you have no business in here. Well, I've been really one of the Lord God. I've been jealous. I'm the only one. You hear the violins in the background <laughs> as he tells this whole long, sad story of what he's gone through. I'm the only one. I'm alone. God sends an angel. Look, put him in the green room. Feed him. <laughs> Let him sleep. Let him rest. And then he woke up after eating and drinking water and being refreshed. And God says, what are you doing here? This time he's saying, what are you still doing here? Yeah. Oh, same spiel he had practiced before. Some people are just used to the same complaint. Yeah. Well, the doctor says it's incurable. Well, the economy is bad. It starts with the same stuff. And then the Lord totally ignores that, which is good because he never shows up to anybody's pity party, no matter what invitation you give out. He doesn't show up. He's not good at showing up to pity parties. Instead, God says, get up and go anoint a king, which was the job of a prophet. Even if he's messed up in the head, God says, get back to work. Go anoint a prophet. You want to come out of your, uh, you want to come out of that cave a little bit faster? Get to work. Do something constructive. I can't. I just don't feel it. I'm not going to be a hypocrite. If I don't feel it, I'm not going to do anything. I won't even go to church till I feel it. If you're supposed to march and you don't 
feel like marching. Here's a novel idea. March without feeling like it. Try it. You don't have to feel like it. I'm marching, but I don't feel like it. Suddenly, in the middle of your march, I feel like it again. And look at all I accomplished because I didn't waste time over here saying I'm not doing anything till I feel it. Remember that cave experience, that middle of the battle. It's temporary. You need to go in it, but you need to come out of it. Psalm 23, used a lot for funerals, but there's a lot of life in it. David said, yea, though I walk through the valley of shadow of death. It doesn't say, yea, though I sit in the valley of shadow of death. Some people just sit in the valley. Oh, man. What an ugly valley of shadow of death. I wonder when the scenery is going to change. I'll tell you when the scenery is going to change. When you get the gluteus up and walk out of it. Okay, I will walk through means I go in, but walk through means I come out. Remind yourself, this is temporary. I got to keep marching and keep walking. Come out of this. We have natural tendencies to expect the worst. So we just hang out, see how this turns out. No, you keep moving. You keep praying. You keep seeking God. Keep getting into God's word. Don't stay away from church. Keep growing. That's how you come out of what you just went into. Secret number two. Something good is going to come out of that battle. See, we believe, oh, this is going to kill me. Stop saying that. I'm going to lose everything. Don't believe that. I'm going to go blind. No, you're not. We have to remember in the middle of the battle that God has promised that something good is going to come out of what you're going through. Or he wouldn't allow you to go through it. Now, some people think he, he, he makes me go through it. God, yes, the Bible says he can make something beautiful out of ashes. But that doesn't mean he lit, he lit the fire that burned the thing that made the ashes. Sometimes it's bad choices, wrong decisions, bad seeds we sow, disobedience, and something burns up, but God turns it around and makes something beautiful out of it. It's the only one I know who can do that. Yeah, there was an artist, Miller, in the, in the 20s in the U.S. here who used to go to a small town and rent the city hall or an auditorium, and he would, was a great painter, but he'd put a white canvas and he'd give three colors to three kids from ages seven to nine. And he'd give blue to one, red to another, green to another. And he'd say, you got 10 minutes, go to town on the, on the canvas. And they would, they'd put spots and lines and make it look like nothing, ugly in fact. <laughs> but after tw 10 minutes, he'd go eh, and then he'd take the brushes. And then he'd get the rest of the paint and out of that ugly looking scribbling and lines and spots, he began to add stuff to it, lines and shadings, and make these beautiful paintings of beautiful trees and mountains of scenery. And of course, the kids on the corner would say, we helped with that. <laughs> yeah, we pretty much spot up our lives and make messes out of it. And God says, give me the brush over here. Let me make something beautiful out of this. Let me take what you've done and make it with meaning now and colors and shades. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things, not some, but all, work yes. together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Yes. Awesome. All things work together. All things that go through your life are like ingredients. Yeah. I'm not a cook, but I was looking at cookies, <laughs> sugar cookies, and their ingredients. Of course, sugar cookies have sugar, and they have eggs, and milk, and butter, and flour, but when I saw that it had um, baking soda, baking powder, seriously? Not in sugar cookies, that ingredient doesn't make sense. Nobody's gonna take a scoop of baking powder and go, mm, good stuff, no, because by itself, that ingredient doesn't make sense to be in a sugar cookie. But when you leave it out, it doesn't have the right consistency, or it doesn't have the right flavor. There are some ingredients that are going to come into your life that by themselves won't make sense. Why is this happening? I don't understand this. God, reveal it to me. Have a prophet reveal it to me 20 times. <laughs> to confirm it. It doesn't make sense. 
and people waste years and months and hours praying and fasting to understand something that you just need to trust God for. Yeah. It doesn't make sense. That ingredient doesn't make sense in that cookie. And that ingredient in your life doesn't make sense. But you know what I have? I have this file called I Don't Understand It. And there's something I don't understand. I just fill, write it down and stick it in that file. I don't understand. Just because you don't know the reason behind something doesn't mean there isn't a reason. Just because it doesn't make sense to your head doesn't mean that that ingredient isn't something God needs in your life to work good things with that and all the other ingredients. Just don't focus on that one ingredient. Don't identify yourself by that one loss, by that one ingredient. You're not the person who was in prison for six years. You're not the woman that was abandoned by her first and second husband. You're not the guy who lost all his money in a business. That's only one ingredient. You put everything together and you'll see that God is working it all for your good. That's only one thing in your life. How can a beautiful pearl come out of such a strange looking creature? I was reading about a pearl. It starts as an irritant in this clam or oyster at the bottom of the ocean. A piece of garbage or sand or dirt goes in and it irritates it and it starts coating it with like a mucous membrane. <laughs> mucous membrane? Yeah. A moco. <laughs> and it coats it so that it won't irritate it anymore and it hurts and it keeps coating it and out comes this beautiful pearl. It starts as a piece of garbage. It starts as an irritant. Some of the most irritating things in your life are going to be the most precious pearls, the most wonderful thing about you. Yeah. You see a woman with a pearl necklace around her house and look, whoa, that is the nicest moco ne necklace I have ever seen in my life. Think about it. That's what it is. <clears throat> But this doesn't make sense, Pastor. I don't know what I'm going through. There's some pretty evil people that are pouncing on me. <coughs> They're jumping on me at work. They're messing with me here and there. <laughs> Psalm 66, 12 says, Thou hast caused men to ride over our heads. <laughs> Have you ever felt like people are riding over your head? <laughs> and then look at the shoe, man. Thank God it's not a golf shoe, huh? <laughs> that would leave a mark. Caused men to ride over our heads. We went through fire and through water. But thou broughtest us out into, into what? A wealthy place. And I looked it up in Hebrew to see what it meant. It means a wealthy place. <laughs> Prosperity, blessings. God knows how to give you the end of the Lord. The end of the Lord. <clears throat> the wealthy place. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. God's going to use it. Even the stuff that squeezes me, yes. It's sometimes like a sponge that's full of old junk. The pressure needs to squeeze it out of us. It's going to squeeze out the unbelief, the doubt, the impatience, the, the anger. It's going to squeeze out some of the old stuff. And once you're squeezed out, I got no strength left, God. I can't even talk. He says, good. Why is that good? Because my strength is perfected in your weakness. Yes. That's what Paul said anyway. But now that it's all squeezed out of you, he puts you in fresh water and you soak it up. Sometimes a new anointing has no space in you because you've got some, so much old junk inside. But God is going to use every battle to create a powerful wealth of victory, a great testimony in your life. And here's what you do to hurry the process. Keep confessing your victory. Stop talking about the awful things that are going on in my life. Right. Giving them strength, uh, building them up and emphasizing them and magnifying them. Do what the Shulamite woman did in the Old Testament. I love her story in 2 Kings. Yeah. Her child died on her lap. 
It was a miracle baby. She couldn't have babies, but God gave her this baby, and he grew up. He was a young boy. He was out working with his dad in the field, and he got sunstroke, the Bible says, and he got very sick. And he did what every good man does when the child gets sick. Take him to his mother. <laughs> they took him to his mother, and she held him on her lap until noon that day, the Bible says, and he died right in her lap. She watched her blessing die. She didn't understand it. But you don't hear her saying, what? What's going on? In fact, the Bible says she picked up the little dead body of her baby, of her son, took him into the prophet's chamber, which nobody went into that place, so she kept it a secret. And closed the door. She didn't tell the servants. She didn't tell anybody what's going on. You know, sometimes you need to do that. If you're in the middle of your battle, instead of Instagramming it today, and letting everybody know oh, this is terrible, I'm going to do anguish. <laughs> Just so we can get like 60 likes or 100 likes. I'll get encouragement there. No, sometimes you've got to put it away and right hand, not let the left hand know what you're doing. She was smart. She knew she couldn't trust people. Now, I know confession's good for the soul. I want to tell everybody what I'm going through. You know, confession's good for the soul, but sometimes it's just bad for the reputation. So clam up about it. And don't tell anybody who's going to add doubts to your doubts and fears to your fears. You think God's going to help you with that? <laughs> Sorry, two ladies dead. She kept it to herself, but was trusting God. She said to a servant, prepare a donkey. I'm going to go see the man of God, her husband, who wasn't that religious. What? Why are you going to go see the man of God today? It's not, it's not the new moon. In other words, he only went to church once a month. What are you going to seek God today? Why are you going midweek? Why are you going every day? Why are you witnessing out in the street? Why? She said, peace. That's what she answered him. And she takes off on a long journey by horse, just having seen her son die and had to leave him in there closed up. I want you to realize what she was facing when she was in the middle of this situation. And the Bible says that when the prophet knew she was afar, sent his servant, asked her how she is, how her husband is, and how is her child. She could have opened up right there and just unsewed and said, poured it out. My husband doesn't understand me. It's the one who made a go for God. And my son died. It was a promise to me. It was a blessing. And the blessing's gone and he's dead. And I had to take this scary trip all the way over here real fast to get <laughs> She could have. She had every reason to. Just pour out her feelings, her confusion, her anger, her sadness, her depression, her anxiety. She had a lot to be angry about. She had a lot to feel sad about. But when he asked, how are you? How's your son and how's your husband? She said three words, it is well. It is well. Oh, why would she say that? Well, she just not being very honest. No, she was speaking faith. Faith doesn't say things the way it is. Faith proclaims things the way they will be when God's finished with your situation. Faith doesn't just say, I'm in pain. Faith says, by his stripes, I'm healed. Faith doesn't just say, I'm broke. It says, my God will supply all my need according to his riches and glory. Faith speaks it as it will be, and that's what she was saying. At the beginning of that battle, she probably had hope holding him in her lap probably praying that he not die, that things get better. And at the end, we know what happened. God raised him up. But it was in the middle that she was really being tested. In the middle, she said, all is well. When you're in the middle of your battle, here's how to talk. Talk as if it's over and you're already a winner. Confess things as they will be when you get the end of the Lord in your life. God's going to take you into a wealthy place. Don't confess what you're feeling right now. Confess it is well because God is in control. Yes. This is going to be for the glory of God. Remember, your power, the power of life and death is in the tongue. It says in Proverbs 18, 21. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. 
Yeah, and they that love it shall eat its <laughs> fruit. So speak life into your problem. Yeah. Speak life yes. into your battle. Don't speak death to it. Learn to say it is well. Yes. That's not lying. That's speaking the word of yes. faith. That's trusting God, speaking as he speaks. Jesus walked into a funeral and he didn't say, yeah, she sure is dead. She is the deadest child. I have. I'm just being real here. He said she's asleep. Not because he didn't know the difference between death and sleep, but he was calling death sleep because death being terminal and permanent, sleep being temporary, he put it into a realm of faith so that he could deal with it by faith. You start making those mountains into the molehills they really are by confessing them, by believing God and speaking. Open that mouth and speak life to your situation. Now, the last secret in your middle of your battle is praise him. Just praise him. What we were doing a moment ago, just praise him. Oh, God, you don't know what kind of a week I've had. I can't just praise him. We don't praise God because we've had a good week. We don't worship the Lord because I've had no problems today. We praise him because he is worthy to be praised. And he is worthy to be praised whether I'm sitting on a throne of gold or sitting on a rusty toilet. He is just as worthy to be praised. Somebody say amen. Open your mouth and praise him in the middle of the battle. That's what Paul and Silas did in Acts chapter 16. In fact, it says in verse 25, And at midnight... Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. When did that happen? At midnight. Now midnight is important. We just skim through that as we read it. Because midnight is at the end of the night and the beginning of the morning. Yes. It's actually midnight. Mid. It's in the middle yeah. of the night. <clears throat> the middle of the battle. Yeah. What did they do in the middle of their battle? They prayed and they sang hymns. You see, we're supposed to do that, but you know, we know with our head, we're supposed to pray right away. We know that up here, but I've seen couples who look, he'll look at her and say, honey, it's really sad. It's a mess. We're gonna have to pray now. <laughs> is it that bad? <laughs> now, is that her first response or is that a last resort? Wow. And some people, it's a last, oh, there's no other way we're gonna have. That should be our first response. It, they, it was theirs. It said, in the, they were, their backs were striped. That means they were beaten, their backs. They were chained up. That means they lost their freedom. And they were put into the deepest, remotest cell, which re represents depression and isolation and loneliness. Same attacks that the enemy attacks God's people today. Number one, stripes on the back have always meant sickness and disease. He'll attack you with sickness. Number yeah. two, Put chains on him. He tries to take freedom away from God's people so you won't fulfill God's purpose in your life. And number three, that depression and loneliness. I'm surprised at how many Christians, when we're supposed to be the happiest people in the world, are some of the saddest people. Oh, I love God, but I'm so depressed. Can you imagine Peter and John saying to that <coughs> sick man at the <coughs> gate called Beautiful? Uh, I'm so messed up. Such as I have, give I unto thee. <laughs> no, I don't want that. <laughs> There's some believers that do that. They'll tell, tell non-Christians, what I have, I'm going to give you. No, 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 thank you. I don't want that. Because all you've got is a messed up, depressed life, and I don't want that either. Wow. You still love me? Yeah. In the middle of the battle, in midnight, under attack, in every way, they prayed and sang hymns. They opened their mouth and began to praise the Lord. Praising God in the middle of your battle is to invite God's presence into your prison, wow. <clears throat> into your depression, into your anxiety, into your hopelessness. The Bible says when they praised the Lord and the others heard them, that means, means they were doing it out loud. The devil hates when you praise God out loud. He hates it because it reminds him of his worst defeat. It reminds him of Calvary, yeah. the death and resurrection yeah. of Jesus. And they praised them out loud, singing. And as they're singing, the Bible says, the jailhouse rock happened. The floor starts shaking. It says that the prison shook from the foundation. From the foundation. 
Listen, that means God gets to the foundation, to the root of the problem, and begins to shake that when he's going to set you free. Their chains fell. The prison doors were open. And their freedom came. But they didn't take their freedom. Any prisoner ever, have you ever heard of a prisoner, the prison door flies open and they stay in? They stayed in. The jailer wakes up and he says, oh, no, the doors are open. They're gone. I would kill myself. No, 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 don't mess with yourself. We're still here. Well, what are you doing here? There was something there even better than their freedom. That was God's presence. We're just going to hang in his presence. Yeah. They were free. But when did the miracle happen? Most of us would say, when the prison doors opened, that's when they were set free. No, when their mouth opened, that's when they were set free. When they began to praise God for his mercy endures forever. When they began to praise God for the beauty of holiness, that's when they were set free. They were still in there, but they were free. The devil beat them up, but they were free. The enemy chained them up, but they were free. And when that happened, the Bible says, then everything shook. The other prisoners heard them. He's not finished with you yet. Your victory is coming. The end of the Lord is yours. You may be in the middle right now, but remind yourself the end is coming. The end of the Lord. I'm coming into a wealthy place. You be prepared. As much as you've suffered, the tears that you've shed, the way anybody has come against you, especially if evil people, the enemy has used against you, that's okay. God knows how to set a table before you in the presence of your enemies. And they're going to watch you get blessed even though they've cursed you. Remember, you are coming out of it. It is temporary. Somebody say, the end of the Lord is coming. Come on, say it. The end of the Lord is coming. God will make something good out of this. I just stay flexible in your hands, Lord. Keep confessing the victory. Don't stop confessing the victory. Don't look around you and describe your feelings and the emotions and the impossibility of your situation. Start saying, I am healed. I am strong. God's provision is mine. A wealthy place is mine. Keep praising the Lord. Stand to your feet right now. This is time to break some chains. This is a time to let the Holy Spirit open that prison doors. But we're going to open our mouths. We're going to open our mouths. Every miracle has two parts. The human and the divine. The supernatural part, that's God's part. Don't, try, don't mess with that. He does that. But every miracle always required something of us. Not because God needs us to do anything for him to work. He just wants our participation. Whether it's the, the man in John 5 who was paralyzed that the disciple told him, make up your bed. Take up your bed. Come on. Or the blind man that the Lord said, go wash your face. Or the, the uh, Naaman who had leprosy who was told, go take a bath seven times. What does taking a bath have to do with healing skin? Sometimes God asks you to do something that seems to have nothing to do with the miracle. It's not up to you to judge it. It's up to you to obey it. That's all. Even if it seems to have nothing to do with it. God knows what he's doing. 